Speaker today is Joel Sartori. Joel has been a contributing photographer to the National Geographic magazine for 22 years. He's had 31 stories published in the magazine, including the story on the Albertine Rift of Uganda that's in the current issue of the National Geographic magazine. That's the November issue. The lead photo in this article is a lion in the tree at dusk, and it was voted the number one photo of the year for National Geographic magazine for two 2011. Joel also has, he has a new book out that's been published by the University of Nebraska Press. Um, it's called Let's Be Reasonable. It's a collection of photos and short essays based on his work with, um, that he's done on CBS Sunday Morning, a show with Charles Kuralt, no, Osgald, sorry, I said that wrong, where he's also a contributor from time to time. And um, you can also buy his book online at joelsartori.com. But the ones that you are here today, we also have it available at the Nebraska History Museum gift shop. And he'll be available to sign the book afterwards. And we also have his book, Rare, also today. So um, please join me in welcoming Joel Sartori. He's going to talk today, Just Keep Driving, Saving Three Old Homes the Hard Way. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. So um, what's the title mean? Anyway, just keep driving. You ever see homes like this out in the country? So beautiful. This harkens to yesteryear, right? Days gone by. Look at that. Two-story sod house. Man, would that be great to restore? Just keep driving. <laughs> Don't do it. Uh, my wife Kathy and I are restoring our fourth such old house. It's been living hell. Um, first claim came the airplane bungalow in Wichita. On day one, I fed a two-before the wrong way into a table saw and blew a hole through the front door. <laughs> it looked something like this. I next hooked a toilet up to hot water in a wasteful accident. <laughs> it was winter after all, though, so we felt like royalty for a bit. So I straightened it out. Um, the finale on that house is when I co completed an electrical circuit on the kitchen sink faucet by accident. We got shocked every time we washed up for dinner. <laughs> Next came a two-story stucco house in Lincoln. Kathy bought it when I was too far away to stock her. From a moldy payphone shaped like a jaguar in the Amazon, I yelled, you can't do that. Yes, I can, she laughed. You gave me power of attorney before you left in case you were kill killed in a plane crash. <laughs> I said, OK. So she said, I've got a consolation uh, prize for you here. Here's a drawing. It says, trust me, um, that's what the house is. You're going to love it. Show up. So I get in the cab at the Lincoln Airport, and I say, uh, he says, where to? I said, I don't know. Here's the address. And that's where I went. Uh, next, there was a, oh, I guess I was happy about it, though, wasn't I? <laughs> next, there was an 1895 Victorian farmstead out by Walton. It came with a, uh, a chicken house and a pair of barns and uh, 20 acres, which needed mowing constantly, it turns out. What it didn't come with was heating or wiring or plumbing. Uh, we took the interior part, numbering the pieces and, and uh, fighting as we went along, I guess. Sweat, such sweet memories. During one argument, Kathy intentionally dropped a four by eight sheet of drywall on top of my head to shut me up. Then there was a night I found a wall of water coming out of the living room ceiling. I just turned off the light and went back to bed. At that point, I hated every inch of the place, to be honest with you. Uh, five years and $100,000 later, we got it listed on the National Register of Historic Places, largely thanks to some of the folks we see in this room. Uh, that's a mighty expensive plaque, though, and I would not recommend <laughs> going through it. Which brings me to my present house, a 1922 money pit. Uh, a once grand estate, it came with an indoor swimming pool, bowling alley, and call buzzers for the maids, none of which have worked in 50 years. We've worked plenty, though, nonstop, roofing, painting, grading the yard, for over 10 years now. This girl was in diapers when we moved in. We're still not done. So, uh, though we got this one on the National Register also, this plaque will cost us double what the one out in the country did. So was it all worth it? I don't know, but we just bought another one. <laughs> Ask me in 20 years. <laughs> so it's a sickness, it's a disease, it's a big problem, and I'm here to dissuade all of you guys from ever doing anything like this. Um, 
Where to begin? Well, we'll start with that, that airplane bungalow in Wichita. This was the day that I uh, accidentally swung a two by four and I conked Kathy over the head. I didn't see her kneeling down to prune some bushes and, it sat, and she was nearly out cold. Had a big Fred Flintstone side egg on her head. And I was like, wow, that sounded like a home run being hit out of a ballpark. That was amazing. <laughs> Did you hear how that sounded? wasn't good. So we, we were young and we were dumb and we thought we'd just do it all by ourselves and gut everything and it was just really an awful experience. <laughs> I decided to spray this house with a sprayer on a windy day and it's just <laughs> dumb, just stupid. You're going to hear me say those words a lot. Uh, the, the Walton farmhouse was, was more in keeping with what we wanted. It was a big prairie style home, almost Victorian. We decided it would be a good idea to elevate the house three feet and put a full basement under it. We didn't know what that entailed, but it entails a lot of money is what it entails. Um, uh, we were uh, happy at the start, as you always are with these projects. You're very excited to buy it. You're very happy to proceed. You think you got the world by the tail. How we came to this house, this was a house that we purchased from uh, Wayne and Norma Hageman out of, uh, out of Bennett. And the, the, you're looking at the plumbing. That's it. It was one of the last houses, if not the last house in the county, to have indoor plumbing. Uh, or to have, uh, to have no indoor plumbing, I should say. Uh, they had a cistern and a hand pump that went into a sink, and that's the original picture, and that's, that's that. The rural water was never run into the house. There was an outhouse. There's also no, no heating or air conditioning or anything. They had an oil stove. That was about it. So um, we, were, uh, we were thrilled that the house was in original condition, which is what we want. We want all those features intact. We want the woodwork and the lighting. That's what we're looking for. Had this old uh, serpentine back couch in the corner, and uh, we just thought we had everything we needed. But, you know, the deeper you go into these projects, the more and more it gets uh, drawn out and elaborate. And we're thinking, well, now that we've got the house up, why don't we go ahead and expand it so we can put bathrooms in? That would be handy, having bathrooms. So <laughs> put three bathrooms in. Well, we're, while we're doing that, why don't we make the master bedroom a little bigger? The trick is to do it in character with the house and not have your way with the structure, which is what we tended to do early on. From the street and from the driveway, you can't tell that this ha we've had our way with a full-length dormer in the back, but we have. There's the full-length dormer on the back side. The O'Hare brothers had done this house for us, and they worked diligently. We did the grunt work, but they're the guys that lifted it, set all those blocks by hand themselves, uh, took to gracefully listened to us express our opinions, which we didn't know what we were talking about, but Rich is, Rich is listening there, though he has his arms folded. That's, he should be like this, right? <laughs> they were very, very tolerant and patient with us. Um, yeah, it just, you know, it just, it just feels like you get a thousand yard stare after a while, especially after you peel up all those cedar shingles. And um, yeah, it's just, yeah. So after a while on this house too, we got to the point where we, we hated every inch of it after a while. It's, uh, you know, walls of water coming out of the ceiling or trying to empty out the, out the plaster so we could insulate it, wire it, plumb it, the whole thing. Um, it eventually comes together. This is Cole, who's in the back of the room now. He's almost 18 years old, so it's been a little bit. Uh, but we tried to use recycled lumber as much as we could on a lot of this project because it's cheaper and it's the right thing to do. For a lot of this framing studs, we had to use new, but um, uh, off we go outside too. We tried to redo, reuse all the original cedar siding, scrape it, redo it. Those are the original windows in the turret. The turret was a uh, was a closet, and we took the ceiling out of the first floor so we could make it open and, uh, and kind of bring it back to where we thought it needed to be. We had 50 doors or so in that house, and we, we, we uh, took out and redid every door, re-glued a lot of them, re-coated them. Um, you know, in a way, it was, a, it was kind of a carefree time because it's feast or famine for me. I was working for the Geographic, but I, when I was home, I was home and nothing else to do, and so we'd have months at a time. This, uh, that, uh, pine flooring and these uh, joists are all out of an old church in downtown Lincoln, which I purchased the salvage rights on for $14, but the only hook was that I had to have it all out in four days, and the high temperature that week was going to be minus 10, and there was no windows in the church anymore and no power or anything, and I remember Kathy bringing me a Runza and crying as she handed it to me and turning around and leaving, and my drink froze up before I could take a drink out of it, so that's all right. That's okay. Good times, right? So this is the this is the original flooring in the house, and through those through the the uh, pocket door back there, you can see the flooring I got from the church, matched perfectly, wow. pr probably from the same mill. I don't know. This is all the flooring. Uh, the O'Hares did a very nice job of of 
kind of tucking the ki creating this expanded kitchen. We used all salvage materials. The, uh, the cabinets on the left are from a butler's pantry out of a house John Spencer redid downtown Lincoln. Spencer Works, you've heard of him. Uh, the countertop in the center, that's an eight-foot uh, bowling alley lane section with the foul line in it still. Uh, holding it up are some cabinets out of one of a, out of a university sale. The bar from Donovan, Nebraska creates the north wall's lower se cabinet section. So we try to use uh, recycled materials whenever we can. It kind of makes the house feel like a home. There's a back hallway that this is all new. Everything you see here is all new, but we try to make it look old. Although nobody in their right mind would put six doorways in one, one hallway, we just wanted some short space to, uh, that's actually the insulative space behind a wood stove, and we just use that to keep our coats warm in the winter. Um, uh, we tried to, uh, tried to do everything in the spirit of the house, but we didn't have to do too much in the way of, uh, of bringing new materials there beyond the uh, expansion. It was pretty much like it needed to be, and we didn't touch the original section of the house, just the, just the add-ons. This is all original. We didn't do anything but clean this woodwork. High school kids had partied in this house for many, many years, and they didn't take anything. They didn't, and there were, I mean, this, uh, this summer cover with Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, was left on the floor, just loose, with beer bottles laying around it. Nobody took a thing. So we're, we're very grateful for that. Those kids are probably 50 years old now who partied in there, but um, never had a problem, never did. Some of the other rooms in the house, this, uh, this center section was interesting in that it's, it was built after the house had settled way, way, way back where the, our renovation was the fourth, but they built these cabinets in a curve. The house had settled so much, they built them in a curve to fit, and those doors work perfectly to this day. That's the only active fireplace left in the house. Um, they had some extra doorways that, that were not original. We could tell by peeling back the siding. We could tell what was original, was what wasn't. We tr tried to put the house back into original condition as best we could. The turret that I told you we opened up, uh, we trimmed out the inside of the windows from the second floor up, but, um, but those panes, those ornate panes in clover and diamond shapes were all original to the house, all of them. It's during the daytime. Uh, staircase going up with uh, kind of a great room with a fireplace. That's a tendency now, everybody wants a great room. But as my friend Charles DeVries would point out to me over and over again, these old houses weren't intended to have great rooms, and if you want a great room, go buy yourself a house in the suburbs, Joel. <laughs> Don't do this. Well, we didn't know Charles back when we did this house, so. Uh, upstairs to the second floor, um, we put in um, a skylight where the addition was, but on this end of the house, it's all original. The only thing we, we really messed with was coming this way, where the addition was, again, so that we could have bathrooms. We wanted bathrooms. Again, Charles might argue against bathrooms, but we wanted them. We figured that would give the house value if we added <laughs> indoor plumbing. Uh, the master bedroom, and then the view out back. Um, lots of, it's on a 20-acre piece, and we planted the farm ground in the back, back to uh, native prairie and wildflowers, which brings in a lot of wildlife. Um, place did come with a couple of barns. That's the, that's the cupola of the barn when we got it. It also came with a lot of hay that we had to push out. It took days and days. I dragged every employee I had out there, and they all took their time, turns uh, shoveling hay out of the loft. That's all original prairie hay. And uh, we rebuilt the, uh, when I say we, I mean John O'Hare rebuilt the, found, the stone foundation on the north end, and also uh, we contracted out to get sawn cedar, the sawn cedar roof replaced too. I know why barns go away. I mean, you're not using the barns for very much anymore. They're, fi you know, they're prone to fire, and just the materials for the roof back then were $18,000. That doesn't include the labor. So this is why I say, just keep driving. <laughs> uh, but in the end, is it worth it? Yeah, I mean, now I look back on it, and I love the place. I just love the place. And um, I'm very glad we did it. But time heals all wounds, doesn't it? <laughs> time heals all wounds. So moving on to Sheridan Boulevard, where we live today. This is what it looked like when we bought it. Uh, brutal, just brutal. Uh, the, the story of how we bought it is kind of a funny one, in a way. We, uh, we had moved uh, three times in 18 months from the farm into town to 2222 Sheridan, and we're working on a house there with a lot of termite damage for some reason. And um, this house, there was an estate sale. It was owned by uh, Phil Aiken and his wife, and Bob Ripley's uh, wife, Stacy, was working the jewelry sale, I think, in that estate sale that day. Well, 
I, uh, I pulled up in my old rusty Chevy pickup truck with the rust holes in it, and I had my painty clothes on. I was working on this other house, and uh, because Kathy had said, go up there and see, it, see what's there. Go on in. I said, you're not thinking about switching houses again. Don't tell me you're thinking about switching houses again. We've only been in this one six months. She said, just go up there and look around. So I went in the house, and as I went in, this lady stopped me at the door, and she said, wait, that's going to be a dollar. I'm thinking, well, you didn't charge the guy in the suit jacket a dollar in front of me, but okay, I'll, I'm, I guess I'm a gawker. I'll pay the dollar. So I go on in. I look around. I go back to our house, and Kathy says, how was I? I said, well, the house is long and shaped like a boat. I kept looking for the captain in the engine room. I, I, uh, not, I, she said, well, was there anything for sale? I said, no, I don't know. Well, is the house for sale? Why would you want me to ask that? So just go back and see if the house is for sale. So I go back. And I say uh, to the lady at the door, but she says, that would be a dollar. I said, I know. I'm not here to look through the house again. I just wondered if it's for sale. And very seriously, she looked me up and down, head to toe, once. And she said, yes, but it's $260,000. You wouldn't be interested. And I went, oh, man. Now I have to buy this house. <laughs> so we did the next day. But we didn't just buy the house out of spite. We bought the house because it was charming and had a lot of uh, nice features, which I'll talk about in a minute. The house also needed a lot of work, and this is the reason that the house hadn't sold uh, before it got to open market. The, uh, the, the house had a, a very, very long, 60-foot long uh, back deck that had never really had a proper roof over it or under it, and it just rained inside whenever it rained outside. So we tore that deck off. By we, I mean John Spencer. Uh, tore that deck off uh, down down to the brick, relayed the relayed the stones, the brick, cleaned all the original brick, put them all back. Had dogs walk through the cement as we poured it. That's Patrick Greff resetting some of the some of the brick at the base of uh, some urns. When we bought this house, the backyard was so overgrown that literally there were vines growing in through some of the rotten windows and across the walls and stopping where the light played out inside the house. So. We didn't know that we had these urns. We didn't know that we had anything back there, really. It was very overgrown. But that's our kind of place. And here's where the DeVrieses come in. I met the DeVrieses through the, through the Powell Brown Bag Luncheon. This is them checking on the status of a bobcat they had over. But it was because Eileen had come to me and asked me to trade a, a Powell lecture for something. And I said, great. Why don't you be my free landscape architect? And she was. And so the first day she came over, um, her husband Charles showed up at lunchtime in this pickup truck with a seven or eight or ten or twenty chainsaws in the bed. And he walked around and he looked and he said, that mulberry tree is rubbing on your house. That thing should come down. And I said, you're right, it, it sure should. And I went in the house and I all of a sudden I hear vroom, vroom. And I run up to the third floor and I look out across the balcony and there's this guy with a beard that's seven or eight feet tall with a little bitty chainsaw, and he's taking that tree down piece by piece. And he had it down before the lunch hour was over with, just about. And I'm like, Eileen, is that, is that your husband? Or who is that? Yep, that's him. So the DeVrieses are a big part of our lives now, and they know what to do, and they know how to keep me from hurting myself, and they also know how to, uh, from wiring sinks up to hot water or to electricity. And they also know what needs to be done really to be a, somebody that takes good care of a place like this. In this case, Charles had pointed out many times that you cannot really solve your water infiltration problems into the basement. We had water problems from the roof and from the basement unless you regrade the backyard. And I said, okay, what's that going to take? He says, it's going to take you buying a, a great big old multi-thousand dollar dump box trailer and we're going to haul out load after load of dirt. And so we regraded that yard. Turns out that when we regraded, all, we took 20 loads of dirt out all the uh, downspouts off the house go to daylight in the backyard, and they were there to water the flower gardens and the trees. So quite amazing. And we, we uh, put down a sod that's a no-water fescue, developed at uh, Mead, University of Nebraska's Mead Research Station. And they put this out. You water to get it in, and then you never water again. I'm a big fan of not having sprinkler systems, especially as we go forward. We're going to run out of water. So uh, I believe in planting something that can tolerate our, our climates here. This grass, is, it goes dormant and brown in the heat of the summer, and it turns green. It's green right now. It's less uh, prone to disease that way. You don't have to aerate the lawn if you don't put chemicals on it either. So we don't water or put chemicals on, and it looks just fine, I think. Uh, this is the backyard today after we put everything back. We were brought a, a, a film. Ann Seidel's uncle lived in this house. I think we're the fifth owner. We were brought a film that her uncle... Howard Wilson shot off the balconies in 1943 and 44 that showed us how the backyard was planted, and it was royal. It really was. 
the, the signature feature of the backyard were these juniper trees uh, planted in forced perspective, so it made the yard look longer as if they needed that. The house already sits on four and a half lots, but it stretches these trees out, makes them look like there's more depth, and they go back to a limestone fountain. And these, uh, we, we found some juniper cultivars that we liked, and Eileen coached us on that, and we planted them, and there they are. So, I mean, the backyard turned out very lovely. It just took a tremendous amount of work, about two years just to work on the back of the house in the backyard. That's a little bit of an aerial view, uh, kind of showing that back deck after we did it. A lot of tile out there, a lot of tile. Uh, moving indoors, the uh, house was covered in a green shag carpet. But again, we loved this house because all the original features were there, and it was a very high-end house at the time. Most of, the, most of the original features were just fine, and they were there. We love it when a house gets frozen in time. I love the fact that the house hadn't had much maintenance done to it in 40 years. That's perfect for us because then we can kind of lovingly thing, bring things back and get things to where they need to be. The original maids uh, call buzzers. There's one at each doorway and one underneath the kitchen, the uh, dining room table in case you have a request for the maid, that would be Kathy or I, to bring you more food. Um, the original telephone still on the wall. Again, uh, with the spraying, I'm done spraying. I'm done spraying anything at all when I go to paint. Uh, down in the basement, trying to redo a few things. This is the pool in the basement, which has not had any water in it since the 60s. Again, uh, we've had people over that have toured the place, and they realized that maybe they were one of the last ones to swim in the pool in the late 60s. The um, water for this pool was uh, heated in a, uh, was it a wood-fired or a coal-fired, maybe coal-fired boiler? which is still there. Uh, it would take three days to fill the pool with hot water, three days for the water to cool, and then you would drain it because you paid for your water by the month and not by the gallon back then. So there's no recirculation. And I've worked so hard to get water out of the basement over the years that I haven't, and we've had little kids. I just, we've just never uh, put water back in, but it's all hand inlaid tile uh, with the original brass rail. It's quite something. And I really wish that we put something in the covenant of this house to keep the next owners, because we're all passing through. Uh, from destroying this room because it's really a treasure, really is. This is the underneath that big back deck. That was originally a bowling alley. It was probably a proper bowling alley built in place. We put a bowling game from the turn of the century in there just to have something to look at. But it is uh, it's dry as can be. Um, the only reason we know that was a bowling alley is because there was a fuse box card buried in a wall when we redid the kitchen that said Circuit 23 Bowling Alley. That's the only reason we know. That was from pre-World War II, we think, before they, before they tore it out. Um, a little detail of the pins. We don't really use the game. It's just for showing off, as they say. Uh, tile is a, is a big part of our lives now as well. If you have a tile roof, you know this. You're always on the lookout. Uh, Ludovici, imperial green tile, flat tile. If anybody watching out there in TV land has some, I'll take them. I'll buy them. I'll pay, pay market price because they're hard to find. This is the same tile that comprises the gold of the dome on the Capitol building. I believe in that, right, Bob? It's flat. I've touched that when the building was being redone. We've got Flat gold. This is flat green. So I've driven, driven many times down to a tile yard in Dallas to pick up what they have as they get it in. It's one of the nation's largest. And bring it back, because we have a lot of tile. When we bought this house, it had four cannonball size holes through the attic roof in different rooms. You could look out and see birds flying in blue sky. The house had no eaves or soffits on the, on the western side. It was really a, it was a pretty run down. And you could see where those holes had been left open. They dripped onto the third floor, rotted a hole, blown the ceiling out on second, started to rot a hole on second floor, blown the ceiling out below in a couple spots. So it's just, uh, it's just a matter of getting those holes fixed. And that was another thing I think scared people off of buying this house because just the roof is a very expensive proposition. I would urge people listening out there uh, to not throw away their tile roofs, by the way. When we re-roofed the garage recently, um, the about the only thing we had to throw away was the old tar paper underneath and some of the broken tile. In other words, you re-roof an entire building and you'd have one garbage can full of debris instead of a roll-off dumpster that goes to the landfill. Tile's remarkable. And if you travel in Europe at all, you see that most roofs are tile. They're not these cheap seven, eight, ten-year roofs that we tend to put on our houses here. So, and tile are just they're lovely, and they, you know, 1922, and they still have that luster and brilliance. Um, our tile work's done primarily by uh, Terwilliger Company, and Bob's retired now, so it's Steve Brestel's taken over for him. It took him all summer to redo this garage roof, and then we had a giant tree land on that roof this fall in the storms and just crushed this thing. But it's all fixed because I had salvage tile all saved up, ready to go. I'm ready to go. 
have to be. This is the interior of the house today. This was, this was shot on Monday, actually. Um, my father likes it because it's not all full of paint cans and ladders anymore and drop cloths, which it was for many, many years. The library, all grain painted inside there. Even the undersides of the, um, in the undersides of the cabinets where the doors close, grain painted, made to look like wood when in fact it's all plaster. Um, the outside of the house as of Monday morning. So the last one, the latest one. Uh, this is out at Dunbar, Nebraska. Again, this is one of those things where we should have kept driving, but we went by this place uh, years ago, and it was offered for sale by this very nice man, Ken Yearsley. Very nice man. And the, the listing agent had said, I'm sorry we didn't get the place cleaned up for you before you came out. And I said, well, what does that mean, cleaned up? He said, well, we were going to bulldoze everything and burn it, push it into a pile and burn it. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm glad you didn't. Because if you had done that, we wouldn't be nearly as interested. This house looks like American Gothic. It sits up on a hill, and it's one of the few houses of its kind, as far as a Gothic house, that still exists in Nebraska. There were five houses, I believe, made in this style. There are two that remain. Uh, they lose them to fire. The first thing we did, again, try to, try to get the house elevated and put a basement under it. It had a stone crawl space, and that was about it. We, uh, we did the same thing we did with Walton, and it, again, it's a six-figure thing to do it. It's a lot of time and money and work and, you know, a lot of going to the bank over and over again. Myron Robertson and his son, Myron Robertson Jr., did all the dirt work and all the foundation work, and they worked for many, many months. Clark DeVries here with his dad's trencher, trenching power in. I like to bury the overhead lines for security, but also visually. It makes it a lot better to photograph if there aren't big old lines going into the house. That's, that's my favorite thing. This is when we first bought the house, we re-roofed it, and we thought we had it stabilized, and then we thought, oh, let's go ahead and finish it. So you notice the door kind of going to nowhere there. All these modifications that have been made over the years, now we've sealed that up. We've healed that. We put, again, you needed bathrooms. The house had one bathroom that was kind of a afterthought on, on the front porch, and we thought, well, we'll go ahead and when we do this little dormer, we'll add bathrooms as well. And Myron and his son framed that in when we started. Down to studs again because the house had no insulation at all. Um, no plumbing, uh, the wiring was all, you know, very minimal, and uh, off we go. So it's a sim very similar thing. Took the chimney all the way down, uh, rebuilt that. Our kids in there sweeping. They don't like going out to these places for, for some reason. They don't like to visit. They don't like to go out there. And as a result, you know, we are probably going to sell this house, at least the property that it sits on, because, uh, you know, I'm gone a lot. I'm a National Geographic guy. I'm not home very much. So we tried doing as much as we could and then enter our hero again, John O'Hare, who comes in and he, uh, and he basically works to finish out the interior of the house, including all these uh, arch windows and arch doors. Uh, very lovely feature to it. In the kitchen, uh, we basically had, we, ex we changed that slightly. We, I had a bunch of cypress from the Unadilla lumber mill when they closed and he made countertops out of that and um, finished the doors in the new, new, new addition, again, just to, have, just to have some plumbing there. That's the house about midway through. It doesn't look midway through, but it is. Uh, the kitchen floor, we, it had two floors. We peeled one off. The bottom one was so beat up that we ended up painting it and doing something that I saw at Martha Stewart's house many years ago when I had to cover her home at Turkey Hill. She'd painted her floor like this, and I always thought that looked good, and here's a perfect excuse. Hanging the shutters. The biggest thing is we had to notch the shutters because our new front porch, the, one, the old one, had fallen off one night. Uh, we had to notch those shutters to get them to fit. Away we go, it's starting to take shape. And uh, you know, now it's really lovely, it's fun. It's a, it's a great place to go, but again, can't get the family interested in going out there very much. Clark came out with some, uh, with some railing that my friend Sten Lundberg gave us and uh, put that in and voila, you know, there it is, about finished. But we weren't done yet. We figured, you know, they're gonna bulldoze and b burn a barn three miles away. How could we let that happen? It's lovely. I had Clark's dad, Wilford, over. He says, this is a nice barn. You should save this barn. Why don't you move this barn? Okay, <laughs> nothing money won't take care of, so we get it loaded up and take it across country. I didn't do it. I hired somebody to do it, obviously, but there it goes. It's coming down the road, uh, and we built a foundation there. We bought that barn from Dean and Barb Neals down the road, and uh, foundation's in, Myron Robertson, Senior comes to the rescue, set the barn down. There's Patrick Greff, the guy that was laying the brick in our backyard. It's the same cast of characters all the time that I drag into these projects. 
Patrick sets the stone. We set the barn down. There it is. And also those doors. Notice those doors. I saw those doors tied up against this building behind the creamery and found out that the Scott brothers owned those doors and they'd been strapped to the side of this building and I called them up and they said, yeah, go ahead. That's a good idea. Put them on your barn. So thank you to the Scott brothers for that. There they are. Of course, we're, uh, we're not complete without uh, having Charles enter the picture again. This is a staircase that's out of an old house at, at 19th and Washington that was, that was a house that Clark owned. And I picked up a, uh, a roll-top desk on garbage night one night years ago, and Charles had to have it. And I said, what do you got? What do you want to trade? He said, uh, this staircase, this, this old staircase right now. What well, was Clark's staircase? I knew that. He said, well, what about it? I can't. I'm not handy. What, what am I going to do with this thing? He says, it comes with installation. You find a place to put it, I'll install it. So that was like, what, 10 years ago? And I said, guess what, Charles? I've got an idea. And he went, oh, man, I never thought you'd have a place to actually install it. But off we go. There's Bo Wickendall, a friend of ours, uh, basically cutting a hole for the staircase to allow that to come up into the second floor of this barn. The, remarkable, the most remarkable thing about this wasn't that Charles was there. Of course he's there. Uh, it was that he grabbed a beam that they took out when they moved the barn. He found this beam out in the woods, and he starts in with whatever I had. I had a lousy wood chisel and a hammer, and he carves this beam like an Amish craftsman and gets that thing to snap tight into the second floor of this barn, and so it is locked in there. It's a, there's no support underneath. It's all supported from above with this notched beam that Charles made by hand in about 30 minutes. Quite amazing. And there it is. There it is. Of course, we're not quite done yet. We're going to re-roof the barn, pour good money after bad. Uh, we found this in an old barn that was being bulldozed, and we're going to put that up here pretty soon. Myron Robertson's going to test his skill and daring on top of the thing and re-roof it with corrugated metal. So now what do we do with it? Well, you know, I'm a photographer, so from time to time I have reason to do shoots out there. This was two weeks ago. Um, had some shoot I had to do for a DVD series, and we figured we'd have Cole and his friends model out there. That's the kitchen today, all finished up. Uh, the wood stove room, complete with moose head. Every house has to have a moose head <laughs> and models. Uh, the former former parlor. This house, unfortunately, was was green painted also, and that paint that was painted over. Our front entryway is the only thing that still has the green painting. You can see that there. Uh, upstairs, we put. We know that the sister's house a mile away has red glass in all the upstairs windows. We couldn't stand the thought of that for fear that we'd all go insane, but we did put red glass in the, in the arched balcony door up top. We did do that. And uh, of course, you have to have models always to show off the place. Why not? Why not? You know, in the case of, of any of these places, uh, it isn't really the house, is it? It isn't really the house. You know, they, they, say that, uh, they say that the house is a stage and we're all players on that stage, right? All the world's a stage. I heard it said one time that, that fashion is truly the highest form of art because we live our lives in it. Well, I would take, I would take exception to that. I would say, you think that's bad, look where the dog was five minutes earlier. <laughs> Not really, it wasn't five minutes earlier, it was days earlier, I'm sure. But you know, when we look at these pictures, we think of all the times we've had and all the memories we've had, you know. I keep my camera handy. I always keep my ha camera handy, especially when the kids are upset, because it forces them to snap out of it and be behave. All of a sudden, when they see that camera come out, oh man, they don't want to be embarrassed, so they behave. Except for this one, Spencer. He's kind of a bad seed in that way. He, um, he's a professional fit thrower, I like to say. And it doesn't matter whether we're at home in the, in the kitchen or whether we're on the road somewhere. Um, or we could be on, it could be Easter Sunday out in the front yard. Uh, it could be at an art museum in Milan. It could be at the Grand Canyon. He doesn't matter. He's, he's ready to go. He's ready to go. We also use these houses for Christmas cards every year, holiday cards. We use the Dunbar Farm to form a cult, it looks like, one year. <laughs> the tiny wife in the background, but she'll grow into her role, I'm sure. Uh, let's see. This is in our kitchen. It's been three weeks. Santa's got to go. That was kind of a classic. That's Rich O'Hare back there, who's done a lot of work for us over the years. Uh, oh, this was last year. We were a little late getting our cards out. <laughs> Christmas was over by the time we sent our cards out. Yes. Anyway, you know, with, with all these things, as we go through the years, you know, we realize we're just passing through. 
That, we're caretakers. There have been entire generations of people that have lived and died in our homes. People we don't know existed. But we're, we're caretakers as well. As we're moving through time, we just try to do the best we can and not screw things up. Previous craftsmanship before World War II was so elegant and so lovely that we know we should have a good time, respect the house we live in, and try to create our, our own memories and take good pictures along the way if we can, try to enjoy this. I mean, they say that, that fashion is the ultimate work of art because you live your life in it. No, not true, really. I mean, I think it's our homes that are the ultimate works of art, especially if you think about what happens there. Everything happens in the home. It's our sanctuary. It's our haven. It's, it's where we go. I mean, truly, our homes done well, especially historic homes, this is the good stuff. This is what we're, what we're living for. Thank you, folks. So, 12.45, do we have a little time for questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody have any questions at all? Overwhelmed. <laughs> Overwhelmed. It looks like a lot of work, doesn't it? Yeah. A lot of work, yeah. It was. Now it was. <laughs> now that you have restored the Aiken house. Yes. You're not going to move away, are you? We're not going anywhere. <laughs> now that I've, re the question is, now that I've restored the Aiken house, we're not going to go anywhere. No, we're not, we're not going anywhere. It's a lovely home. They're redoing our, our streets and our curbs right now. How can we leave that? That's going to be luxurious. It's going to be beautiful. Right, I mean, it's going to be beautiful. So, no, we're, uh, we're not going anywhere. It's really a lovely place. You remember that this is your old gardener. Yes, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Nice to see you again. The former gardener of the place. I'm the gardener now. I'm sorry to take your job from you, but... You did wonders in that backyard. Well, thank you. Thank it you. It was always a headache. Yeah, I bet it was. Pretty, the backyard was a little overgrown, huh? Just a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just a bit. Yeah. Well, 25 dump truck loads full of dirt, and there you go. Anybody else? Yes. We still have that <coughs> built-in refrigerator. Yeah, we do. The the thing Spencer was climbing up into like a monkey. That is a built-in refrigerator. It still works. The compressor still works. It's not quite as efficient as a modern refrigerator, and the freezer is about this big. So we just use it as a storage thing. But I turn the compressor on once in a while, keep it oiled up. It's down in the basement. Yeah, the original fridge. You know, it's probably a fridge from the mid '40s, though. It probably is. Charles, of course, helped me determine that one night when neither of us had anything to do or wanted to get any sleep. We looked it up, and you can look up just about anything now on the web, and, and we pretty much got it down to 1943. Was that about right, Charles? World War II era? So that, that kitchen is not the, what we did is not the, we didn't replace the original kitchen. The original kitchen was very small. It usually was. Uh, a house that size would have had a cook, and um, they were not given a lot of space or a lot of luxury. So. Um, yeah, it's, it, what we've done is probably the fourth kitchen in that house, and it won't be the last. Kathy, my wife of many years, don't say anything negative. <laughs> Are you sure you want to sell that lovely Dunbar farm? It is lovely, isn't it? So it is, I know, it kills me. It kills me to sell that house. You don't. Uh, what are we doing? We're heating it all winter long. <laughs> you know, you get the bills. I have to pay the bills. It kills me. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't. Yes, Clark. I heard there was a fly issue out there. There is a fly issue out there. Thanks for killing any potential sale that house. <laughs> I need to put storm windows up, and that will stop the flies from coming in. <sighs> Stan? <laughs> yes, she does want a new kitchen. I don't know why I called any of you people to come to here today. I was afraid the room would be empty, so now it's just my friends heckling at this. Oh, we're out of time. I see uh, Andy. I, I was just going to say, not, uh, I'm, I'm uh, amazed not just at your ability to revision <coughs> these, uh, these homes, but your ability to talk all these people into helping you. Yes, isn't that amazing? Yes, yes a lot of free work up there on the screen, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, nothing's free in this life, though, is it? Yes? You can cure the, the heat uh, problem for the farm out in the country by spending another 20000 on the ground, a couple of heat pumps. Yeah, we could. Another twenty? What the hell? <laughs> yeah. Joel, what have you done with the, uh, with the garage at the Aiken home? Well, the garage at the Aiken home, uh, we basically had a... Uh, 
But the upstairs, it was roughed in for plumbing. It had water and it had, uh, it had sewer, basically. But it, we didn't think it had ever been hooked up. And at one time, I wondered whether you had lived up there and you'd said oh, you no. had not. Um, so it was just studs upstairs. And um, we got a permit to, to build a residence up there, a single, just a small little studio apartment, basically, where my assistant Katie lived for a year or two. And then she got married. And we got, uh, basically, it's my office now. But it's it's cozy. It's it, all insulated, you know. Uh, everything's everything's pretty efficient, and uh, it's lovely. It's really nice. I always heard that was the servants' quarters. I'd heard it was servants' quarters too, and they had it roughed in for a bathroom. But you know, we just could never see any evidence of anybody living up there. It looked like kind of a kid's playhouse or something, a raccoon playhouse too. <laughs> it's really nasty. Yes. Do you feel incomplete? Regarding the swimming pool? Do I feel incomplete regarding the swimming pool? Well, Stan Lindbergh has already told me how I can get that pool back in operation. But I store all my images, all my slide images, a third of a million of them in that basement, and I don't want to introduce moisture. And um, I'm not much of a swimmer. And uh, I just I want the room to be preserved. And so we may go ahead and restore that room just so whoever buys it will be less tempted to gut it. That's the only reason we'd probably do it at this point. But no, I don't feel too incomplete because when you take people into that room and they see it and it's kind of nasty and they're not expecting it, holy cow, we get some good reactions. <laughs> <laughs> and if, you know, if it had pool water in there, they'd be able to smell it and they'd know what was coming. So I like the surprise. I like the shock value of that, that little room. And uh, you know, when we toured that house, the realtor really didn't know what was in that room. The door was kind of rotted off the jam, and we pried it open, and there it was. There's a little cabana outside with two changing stalls and a shower and a toilet, and we thought, why is this here? And then we jerked on all the doors in the room, and that one came open, and there it was, this kind of hidden pool. It was quite remarkable. That's when we knew we wanted to buy the place. I mean, it's foolish, isn't it? It's just foolish. I always say the only thing this house doesn't have is a tunnel. And I told Clark that, and he built a tunnel at his house, and they beat me to it. <laughs> so I'm still thinking about a tunnel someday. That's what we need, like a hole in the head. Yes? I live in Odo County, so I, think, I came in late, but I thank you for uh, taking care of the uh, Yearsley home and the Neal's barn. Sure, absolutely. Our pleasure, and we're going to pass the hat later. <laughs> No, we really, we, we really love the, these places. They're great. And they, uh, uh, somebody needs to, needs to save a lot of this. It's our history. Saving things is what Kathy and I like to do. We really do. We would never live in a new home, uh, only historic homes. And that's what we're really quite interested in. And as farms get bigger and bigger, you see a lot of these homes going by the wayside. And most of the stuff in the Dunbar house, for example, in Ken Yearsley's place, if we built an addition, all the new material in that addition came from other farmhouses that were falling down. People like Ernie Wolf gave us permission to come in and salvage these places, or Jerry Weebush, and take the, the beadboard ceilings out and take the floors out and save them so they could be put to good use. So it's no problem finding other building materials green, in a green way, unfortunately. But that's kind of how we, how we do it. Anybody else? Anybody else? Ed, would you please list that house out by Dunbar now? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be signing books out in the hallway. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>